Welcome to the Brain Coffee Podcast, where doctors Eric Luthard and Albert Kim unlock life's little mysteries about health, wellness, entertainment, technology, and how the brain makes sense of it all. Sit back, relax, and open up your mind. How's it going with the dog? Ah, she's doing better. Yeah. She's still a puppy though, you know, six months. Does she wake you up? Uh, not, not as much. No, she can go on her own, but then she makes mistakes. But, you know, there are other reasons I'm not sleeping that much, yeah. you know, work my daughter, and... Yeah, my daughter actually just woke me up in the middle of the night because she had a nightmare. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, so she needed some, you know, uh, some extra snuggles in the evening. It's, uh, I see, I see. It's interesting about sleep. It's also interesting when you think about, like, just, you know, kids need so much more sleep than we do. Yeah, yeah. They, there are a lot of things going on when they sleep. They're growing. They're actually... Learning. It's a, yeah, learn. Actually, this is. A, I mean, it's an interesting question. Why, why sleep at all? What's the purpose of sleep? Yeah, it's actually. A, it's, a, it's a fundamental question. Because everything in biology sleeps. Yeah. You know, meaning from like yeast cells to fruit flies to rats to primates, everything needs yeah. to sleep. Worms. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Flies, like you said. It's interesting. I think that one of the fundamental kind of ideas is that if you've got a nervous system. Yeah, it, it basically, and that nervous system needs to learn. It, it has to sleep to reconsolidate the information and to just get rid of, you know, we've talked about brain poop in the past. You yeah, know, right, right. Poop, you with Dr. Holtzman, meaning that uh, all the work that it does in, in uh, managing that information uh, creates a lot of, for lack of a better term, you know. Uh, toxins of toxins, wakefulness or toxins something. Toxins of wakefulness, right, toxins that it has to clear out. Yeah, yeah. And, and if it doesn't, bad things happen to the brain. Yeah, no, we see it all the time. Like, uh, you know, after operations or we have someone in the hospital in the ICU for a few days, they don't sleep for three days. 100% of people go psychotic. Completely right? delirious. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, uh, it's called ICU, ICU syndrome, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's really funny, but it's interesting how um, sleep deprivation kind of plays a role in our lives. I just think about when we trained as residents. Oh, yeah. I mean, things are a little different now. I, right. Duty hours, you know, we can only work 88 hours a week now. And... Which people laugh about, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, but it used to be that literally we would, you know, we'd be on call every other night. We wouldn't sleep every other night for years. Yeah. And I mean, uh, I would say what probably, you? yeah, I mean, on average, probably 120 hours or so a week. Absolutely. Again, not anymore, but like when we were training for sure. And it, what do you get, think it did to you? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting uh, dynamic because I, re I remember like there's, you know, I would go, there's a couple episodes where I went, you know, 36 or 40 hours without sleep. And oh, I remember yeah. like walking outside and maybe seeing a few rainbows that weren't there. And, and it, you know, a lot of weird <laughs> perceptions. So that's clearly not, you know, kind of in and of itself healthy. But, you know, one of the things that I grapple with is uh, as people, you know, try to constrain work hours, control, and with the, the the reason being is that they want people to get more sleep. They, that, right, that, that's right. a safety thing for uh, physicians and, and training physicians. The flip side, although I think is also interesting, is that yeah. when you work as intensely like we did, you know, uh, you know, two, three, you know, four years in a row like that, the amount of experience you get, both from kind of clinical exposure and clinical training, but also you learn to be tired and basically be able to be tired and still effective. Yeah, it's important. Actually, in fact, to this day, you and I, we have cases that are 12 hours sometimes. That's right. I'm tired. You're right. You get but tired. you need to, you but need you to know make... how to deal with that physiology. Exactly. And, it, and you have to do a perfect job still, right? For still, that patient. Right. Yeah. And if you're never exposed to that, I think you completely fall apart. And uh, uh, kind of our boss, Ralph Dacey, he often talks about this idea of psychomotor endurance right that, you know that just as you learn to develop endurance when you're running or learn to develop various types of endurance through kind of repetitious training that sometimes that sleep deprivation you're essentially training your brain how to endure that better than if you'd never done it before like again we talked about you know kind of the, the you know toxins of wakefulness yeah yeah but as an analogy you know we have toxins of uh, physical activity, lactic acid. Yeah. If you've never trained for a marathon and somebody put a gun to your head and said, okay, go run that marathon, your lactic acid's gonna go crazy. Yeah, your body your can't body take gonna it. Your fall apart. Exactly. You'll collapse, exactly. And, uh, but when you train, your body can deal with those toxins. Exactly. And that lactic acid and process it in a much more efficient fashion. Yes. And I think the same is true for training in sleep deprivation, that I think you become trained to handle those toxins better, is my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that's, there's also probably a, an individual aspect of it. That's I right. mean, probably, that's right. I mean, there's probably some self-selection about yeah. who wants to be, mm -hmm. you know, the type of physicians we are. Right, right, right. Are people probably who can take sleep deprivation a little more. That's so. right. You know, I remember seeing, I think there are genetic variants 
where pe certain people you know need more or less sleep. So you're, yeah, you're exactly right. right. Yeah, yeah. I think there may be some self-selection there. Yeah. No, but I, I absolutely agree. There is some training involved. The debate ongoing now is, yeah, sure, we get a little more sleep now with our training um, because of duty hours, but then what do, you, what do you sacrifice? What do you lose? Do you get a better or worse surgeon at the end of it? Right, right. And uh, that's a really hotly debated active uh, topic. Exactly. So, I mean, what we got to do is we have to develop some pill to get rid of the toxins. <laughs> right, and then right. you can, you know, get as much experience as you can. You don't have to sleep. You don't see any bad effects of sleeplessness. I, I feel like that was a movie. Maybe not. But, like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, certainly there are pills out there. But, uh, but yeah, it was for fighter pilots. To, yeah, yeah, right. So they're, they're vigilance bombers. drugs yeah. that don't really yeah. make you hyper. They just keep you alert exactly. and awake. That's, that's right. For long periods um, of time. I don't know. I don't know if it gets rid of the toxins. Yeah, I don't think it gets still. rid of the toxins, right? But it just keeps you awake. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There are definitely some bad effects of not sleeping. That's absolutely uh, right. I mean, despite our having to train to sort of get used to a little of that at least. But, you know, are there other things that sleep might be doing? And I think people are really interested in... Well, remember when we interviewed uh, David Holtzman, he talked about how sleep deprivation increases the deposition of beta amyloid, one of the proteins involved with Alzheimer's. So he is very meticulous about getting good sleep these days as essentially kind of a, a healthy lifestyle to, you know, as a preventative for Alzheimer's. Right, but right. Certainly one of the things we know, and this is one of the things we published in my lab, was that uh, sleep is really important for the consolidation of memories. Meaning that when you're awake, uh, kind of the, the covering portion of your brain, the cortex, right. is communicating with the main memory organ of your brain, the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. And basically signals are going from the cortex to the hippocampus while you're awake. But then when you're asleep, that flow of information reverses. And the hippocampus then is communicating with cortex. And I think that that's a long-term encoding of that information that you picked up through the course of the so day. So this is in, in humans? In humans, that's right. That's so cool. One of my buddies has a very similar finding in, in mice. Uh -huh. So he, he basically... Uh, makes these mice go through a maze and he listens to the neurons in the hippocampus uh -huh. and then uh -huh. he has them sleep. Right, right. And the pattern uh, of neurons firing uh, when the mouse is going through the maze is exactly recapitulated when they're sleeping, but at a t compressed time yeah, frame. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. It's almost like they're memorizing the maze when they're sleeping. Right, right. No, that's exactly yeah, right. Yeah. And the fact that it's compressed, I wonder if that's why our dreams are so weird. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know that uh, we are to some degree experiencing these things but they're in a compression format. You know what I mean? Right, like, right. you know, that we got a zip, zip <laughs> yeah, format. Yeah, it's a zip format for, you know, <laughs> our memories. And so basically we experience these things in some type of way that it's being organized, but it's not experiential, right? right. You know, like, yeah, yeah, and that's why kind of, you know, you see your aunt with an astronaut and a, hippop a hippopotamus and they're all kind of melded together, you know? <laughs> right, like, right. Uh, and that's, that, that represents more kind of the process of how the, the memory is being embedded. No, you're right. You know, there's, there are other interesting aspects about what you just said that, I mean, you know, we think that we, we take in all the information in our environment in a 100% sort of uncompressed way. You, do you know what I mean? Like, let's I know take exactly vision. What you so mean. let's take vision. We see a car, we see a, a field, we see a store. Mm -hmm. We think it goes through our eyes, 100% of that information. 100% of that information goes through like the wiring, this. Yeah, this and then fashion. it goes back to the cortex. But, right. like, how much of it is actually getting uh, to your cortex? Actually, you know, and the people have looked at this. Yeah. So much of the world we experience is actually just being created by our brain itself. Right. They're, they're, our brain essentially creates models of what the world does and then makes predictions on that. And we occasionally tweak it and update it with the actual information that's coming in. Even though the extraordinary capacity of kind of, you know, our brain and all the interconnections is at the speed at which it would take to t recreate each moment by each moment. Each pixel, each, each pixel, sound. sound yeah. like, is not possible. <laughs> so basically what our brain does is it creates models of what it's expecting to see and it confirms it with, with the sensory stimulus. So, so much of the world we live in is what our brain creates for us. Yeah, which yeah. is kind of matrix-like, you know? I mean, so, it, so only a fraction of the information comes in and then we impose some kind of worldview on it, right? Exactly, that's right. So, that's right. so about the memories, yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe with a zip format, right. you're only encoding sort of the, the major, most fundamental aspects of that memory. You're modifying the models. Yeah, yeah. I right, mean, it's right. not the entire memory that you're encoding. Exactly, you're right. Sleeping. It's only just keeping the important stuff. Yeah. Uh, like the, the subtle differences. I actually think that that really plays into some interesting things. For instance, if we live in the world our brain creates for us, mm -hmm. you know, that, that gives us a lot of power and it's, it's, it's empowering. And I think that's why, for instance, if you're depressed, the world's a bad place. Right, right. If you're an optimist, you know, or that uh, that you, how you affect your perspective, that the world's a good place. Yeah, and so I think that's why you know it's so interesting how 
so much of reality is really in our head. Yeah, no, no. It, yeah, I mean, I can think of some legal implications. I mean, you have witnesses looking at the same thing, oh. and it's completely understandable that they really will think they saw different things because you're, you're uh, filtering so many things, and each individual has different filters. And people have looked at this, like, you know, literally, like, you know, people yeah. who are witnesses truly think that they've seen, you know, something, and it's completely different, you know? <laughs> right, right. Or I think a classic example of kind of like this disconnection between kind of the model your, your brain builds and reality. Uh -huh. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you you think you recognize somebody. Oh, yeah. And you're sure yeah. it's that Every person. Days. Exactly. And then you go up to that person to say, hey, John, and they turn around or they... And it's not that person. And suddenly you have this bizarre internal frame shift. Like, <laughs> right, right. like where it's literally like, you know, re reality shifts, you know? And Actually, I did it. I thought it was my dad, and it was this random Asian guy. <laughs> I mean, that's how could I make that mistake? Right, you know? right, right, right. But it, again, it's your brain imposing <laughs> on the, the, the world that you're living in. Right, right. I think that's really fascinating. It's interesting. So we're sleeping, we're making models of our memories, models of the world. Well, sleep certainly is, is important for, yeah. I think, uh, general consolidation of your of your metabolism by the food. So like if you don't sleep, your immune system doesn't work as well. Your I mean, stress levels are higher. Yeah, that, that, yeah, right. I mean, it's not gonna make you have a cold, but if you're, there's a virus around, you're definitely you're more susceptible it. to it. I, totally I think it's just, I think it may just have to do with energy allocation, meaning that when, if you don't get sleep, your, your brain and your body have to work so much harder right. to do what it needs to do to kind of uh, function in the setting of all those various toxins, right? And, uh, and if it's got more work to do, that just means it's, that's less energy it's allocating to the immune system and, and various kind of things to basically cause your body to heal and grow. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. I mean, this is a bit off topic maybe, but um, I mean, another reason people think uh, we sleep, you know, besides the memory consolidation uh -huh. and some good things and then the toxin uh -huh. removal is, uh, you know, during evolution, and, and in sort of early stages of man, mm -hmm. no electricity, maybe no fire. Right. So it's darkness in the, in the middle of the night. So, you know. Why waste resources? Exactly. Maybe you should sleep so you don't jump off a cliff by accident or walk off a cliff. You know what I mean? Oh, that's interesting. What do you, what do you think about that? Um, I, think it's, I think it's interesting <laughs> and it, it makes a lot of sense. I, although I wonder, maybe even getting a little bit more fun, but the thing is, like, you know, worms sleep. Yeah, this is like sleep. circadian so rhythm, it's rhythms. So, it's stuff. so fundamental. I actually <clears> wonder, <throat> well, I think, yes, that's true. I actually wonder if it has to do with, like, really fundamental dynamics of the Earth, meaning, like, you know, yeah. that because the world rotates, you know, at a certain, you know, cycle, and because, you know, you've got wave cycles, you know, meaning that, like, because the moon is causing wave cycles in the oceans, that those fundamental physical rhythms has... A, affected our biology since we are like monocellular organisms. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's right. I mean, not that our reason and will can't overcome our sleep drives and stuff like right. that or, or make light or, right. but I, I think you're right. I, I think there are a bunch of genes, clock genes, right? That's Circadian right. genes. And they are universal. Yeah, yeah, down to sort of single cell um, organisms. And, and you're like, well, why do they need clock genes? I think it was for like feeding and things like that, right. right? Well, like for instance, like feeding when, again, there's a light cycle and a dark cycle. Exactly. Right? I mean, like at the light cycle, maybe photosynthesis is happening. That's yeah, not, there's it's more time food to eat. In a certain right. area. You know, and then, and exactly. when there's not, then like you might as well be quiescent. You right. Know? And, and, yeah, exactly. And so this is still also in our genes, although in, you know, different ways. Yeah, but I, th I think that this rhythmicity to biology is a really fascinating thing. I was actually, you know, just a, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was in you know, Florida with my daughter, my son. Ergo the tan. The tan, yes, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I remember, you know, my kids are just just so overjoyed to be kind of, you know, in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And there's something fundamentally relaxing about those waves, oh, right? Yeah, no, I agree. And, and I, I st and this is the geek in me, but I started to calculate what's the frequency of those waves. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, and it's around three hertz, right? And uh, three, okay, okay. You know, three to five hertz. And what's interesting from a brain rhythm standpoint is three to five hertz is a theta rhythm, which is associated with meditation and relaxation. Hmm. The engineering term for the sound of the waves when you hear them in the ocean is pink noise. Like it's noisy, but there's a, there's a structure to it. Theta rhythm, interesting. And, um, and I think the fact that you've got these waves at theta rhythms is creating these rhythms in, in your perception, which is creating rhythms in your brain that's fundamentally relaxing. Huh. You know, and so it's interesting how these core rhythms of nature, I think, are fundamentally affecting our biology. Really, probably from the time we were, you know, we started as organisms to even now, in, in like, you know, sitting on the beach. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. You know, uh, it just reminds me of the stages of sleep, right? Like, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So, so awake is zero, and then one, it's, it's, things are just starting to change. Two, 
you're starting to really uh, enter sleep. And then these slow wave that's stages, right. three and four, that reminds me of these slow that's exactly hertz right. waves, they're, yeah, they're, they like, are, the, like they're, the water. They are slow hertz waves. And, they're, and, these, and basically, that's when you really, there are these large waves in the brain that are essentially you know, canceling out everything else. And that's when you're in very, very deep sleep. Right, right. right. And then, but then we dream in the sub- and, and REM. Right, and in the subsequent. Yeah. And, then, and, and ironically, REM looks like you're awake and some, th- exactly. right? Exactly. It, it's very disorganized and... Yeah, REM, yeah, it, it's a fascinating thing is that while, uh, you, when you look at your brain rhythms, again, you mentioned like there's these multiple stages, the deep stage is slow wave sleep. Again, the, the brain rhythm is just this, it looks like shark tooth, right? You know, you're kind of getting to the, the, the absolute most simplest kind of... Um, cortical physiology that you have and then but basically once you go to REM uh, it, it, the physiology and the signals they look very much like the awake state yeah, but, that's but you're not awake and the thing is I guess you're in a sort of certain sort of sense conscious but you don't re- remember it right and uh, people are really studying this phenomenology so deeply right now because it's fascinating it's these alternate states of consciousness that are critically important for our you know, our biology, yeah, and um, and in many ways, they still remain mysteries to us. Yeah, no, they really are. And you know, there's, I mean, just REM sleep generally is so fascinating. People have disturbances in REM. I mean, people have probably felt this, right? And when you're dreaming, you're trying to run away from some ghost or you know right. monster, and then your legs can't, won't, you know, it feels <laughs> like you're going through molasses. You can't right. run fast enough. I mean, you're probably, and, and you remember that part of the dream, you're probably waking up a little, and you know, during REM, your body's paralyzed. That's right, yeah. that's right. And so probably it's a real physical perception well, yeah, of what's you, going on. Yeah. Well, I don't think you, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Um, it's not exactly a night terror, but basically when you wake up uh-huh. and you're having a dream, but you, you are, the, the, the physiology associated with the paralysis is still present. Yeah, exactly. And so you wake up. And you quite literally, you know, can't move your arms and legs, and are experiencing something that's both between, you know, physical wakefulness and a dream. Yeah. And you, it is a terrifying. It happened to me like I think once or twice when I was a teenager, and it was it was terrifying. I, yeah, said, I still yeah. remember it. Yeah. No, I can I can imagine. I also think that's the reason you can't run away from the monster. Right. Right. Yeah. Right, 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 yeah. Exactly. Because you feel that paralysis that your that your brain is imposing on you during REM. Yes. Yeah, so fascinating. <laughs> I had a patient. Uh, the other day who came in after a, a trauma. This was about two days ago, still isn't awake. It was, mm. a, it was a bad car crash. But it's, uh, you know, I, I just don't know. Like, as you whether see, they'll wake up. Yeah, right? exactly, whether they're gonna wake up. There's, there's a significant amount of damage in the brain, and so they're in a coma, you know, so. It's interesting how people, when we use the term coma, when we want people to wake up from their coma, it's probably actually not an accurate description. In many ways, that. When you think about... Oh, yeah, wake up might not be the right verb. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Because when, when you're asleep, when you wake up from sleep, sleep is a really active process. Even though your body's laying there still, your brain is doing a lot of work. Yeah. To, again, as we mentioned, consolidate memories and reorganizing, clearing waste. When you're in a coma, your brain's injured, and it's not doing either of those things. Yeah, it's, it's not organized enough to be doing sleep. The sleep is, a, is an important cognitive function. That's actually mm-hmm. one of the things that we're looking at in my laboratory, how oh, wow. uh, we're actually looking at the, the differences between, uh, you know, certainly sleep and awake, actually for a brain-computer interface, so that a brain-computer interface can know if you've got, imagine if you've got a, a thought control device, it should know that you're awake or asleep so that, for instance, if you're dreaming, it's not randomly controlling something in I a see. weird way. You're not driving while you're sleeping. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but we're also you know, extending these applications to coma because, and as it turns out, there's a lot of really different frequency interactions that happen uh, in your rhythms hmm. uh, when you're asleep that don't happen when you're in a coma. I see. And so again, those frequency interactions are different neural circuits interacting, again, likely for consolidation of information, which you just simply don't see. Which also means when you think about that from a coma standpoint, that means that your brain isn't doing the necessary things to consolidate memory. It's not doing the necessary things to kind of clear toxins. Right. It's not doing all the necessary things for brain health. So, and that's why I think when, when coma goes on for a longer and longer duration, that's why it's, it necessarily means it's worse and worse for that person's brain. Yeah, no, I agree. It's interesting. I was just thinking about it, uh, you know, when you're talking about how wake up is the wrong thing to really, the wrong way to think about it. I mean, maybe it's kind of like a, a TV. So when everything's working, you see a picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, you shake up the TV, you know, like kind of like in an accident. Right. A few of the wires are broken. Over time, one of those wires 
gets repaired, another one. But you still you still can't turn on the TV. Right. You right, know? right, right it's right. only when all those wires are put together, the whole thing is working order. Then the TV turns on. That's right. Right. That's so right, yeah. I, I think it's it's a, a very similar thing happens during the reparative process if you're going to wake up in coma. You right. Know? Yeah. So so I guess what is the correct term for recovering from a coma? You yeah. Know, is it, uh, is it uh, uh, restoring from a coma? Is it uh, yeah. you know recovering from a coma? Repairing, repairing from a coma. You <laughs> right. know, uh, resetting from a coma. Yeah. Uh, but it, it it is actually not wake up because you're not sleeping during a coma. Because I think a lot of people, and it's understandable when when you see a person in a coma, you think they must be asleep. Right. 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 But they're not asleep. You know, they're they're turned off. Exactly. The brain is turned off, and that's not good for the body and the brain. Right. This is a little non sequitur, but it reminds me of induced coma. I mean, maybe it's more like induced sleep. Mm -hmm. I was just, I know we, we saw this movie a long time ago, this Alien Covenant. Oh, I just, yeah, yeah. I just saw it the other day again uh, on <laughs> That's HBO. A, good movie, by the way. <laughs> a little scary, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, but, you know, they're in these pods and they're in, it's, they call it an induced coma or something. I mean, right, it's right, not right. a coma, your brain's not in, injured. All right. Uh, but you're sleeping for a long time to get to somewhere in space. Yeah, but what I think is always interesting about that, they're always kind of laying down in this bed, in like some, you know, pillowed bed. Yeah. And we know from experience, like people who are in the intensive care and are in comas, they, you know, they rapidly lose muscle mass. And, oh, yeah. And so if you're in bed for two weeks, you're going to have trouble walking in the hallway after that. Exactly. exactly. And so these people who are in, in induced comas are like the, the science fiction pods and these, like, and that they just kind of like open their eyes and just walk out. That's, that ain't happened ever. Right. You know, you would exactly. have to, you'd really have to do something that like, you know, stimulated their muscles on a consistent yeah. basis, you know, throughout the course of that. They would almost have to like be in a coma, but have a robotic exoskeleton constantly moving them around. Yeah. Yeah. In know? a physiologic way too. Cause in like, it's not just like you can stimulate randomly, you know, the muscles. You'll just get up, open your eyes, and then suddenly you'll be just flex everything at the same right, time. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's not very That's right. useful, you know. Right, 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 right. But yeah, you're right. They, they, what they should show, in like, you know, you know, like in the Matrix or Alien Covenant, any yeah. of these space things, they, they should wake up. And I guess they do it right. In Matrix, the guy does fall. I mean, collapses because he doesn't true. have any muscle. That, uh, that is true. You're actually, yeah. you know what? Matrix is on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But that's right. I mean, the, the, the level of you know, like motor tone and muscle atrophy would be extraordinary. If you yeah. did it for 100 yeah. years. Right, right. You'd, you'd probably just be a, a brain and a skull, you know? And, yeah, just uh, skin, skin and, and bones. bones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, a, and a bunch of ulcers. Right, 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 right. absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's like an ICU, they, they're they turning our patients, right? Absolutely. Like every hour or something like that? Even more than that. I yeah. mean, and you have special beds that are kind of like, you know, um, uh, kind of they have these air filled pockets that kind of, you know, move and pulsate. As I think about it, yeah, we would be, we would wake up, we could open our eyes, we can't get up, skin and bones and one big blood clot. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> in, our, in, our, in our veins. Yeah, because all, there's just no movement of the blood. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> So it actually does, it, it, it does create an interesting question. And, you know, for long-term space travel, mm -hmm. where perhaps, you know, putting into some type of induced suspended state is the way to go because, you know, you're going to be in a small, you know, kind of small enclosure for, you know, just to get to Mars, it takes six to eight months. Yeah. Right? What would you have to do to that person to, uh, to really make that work? Yeah, right. right. You know? No, I agree. And actually just speculating, maybe actually... When we think of, when we think about the space pods and going to Mars and what you'd have to do for it, maybe it actually does make sense for kind of ICU patients. So, so, for instance, should we put electrodes on all their muscles just to stimulate them? No, that's a that's an interesting question. Maybe by uh, kind of, I mean, nerding out so to speak about these space pods, you improve ICU, ICU care. care. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I like really, this idea about the muscle stimulation. Actually, you know, like you know, like just put a bunch of muscle stimulators on them. And at the very least, they, they don't lose some tone and muscle mass yeah. over an extended period of time. I mean, that actually, you know, the space pods may actually help the ICU patients. That's interesting. Huh. There must be other things that they could do that would be similar because it's just such a huge problem. I mean, I don't know how they would, I mean, I guess in space they would have to thin your blood then. I mean, taking, yeah. right, taking right. a page from the ICU, uh, if right. you're going to be lying around, you get the blood thinner you yeah. know, every yeah. day. I mean, you literally have to be in a robotic, I think you're right, like a robotic exoskeleton. But it actually, that would be to kind of make sure your muscles don't tense up. Right, right. But then you would also have to be stimulating the muscles to make sure that you don't lose muscle mass. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. The exoskeleton would only give you range of motion. You're right, right, right. to prevent contraction. You need the stimulation for the muscle. You're right, you're right. It's complicated. I mean, the other way to do it, quite honestly, and this is completely separate, is uh, <laughs> just live out the generations 
the 10 years it takes you to get there, to I, Alpha Centauri or yeah, whatever. I've actually, there's some good <laughs> books about that. Like yeah. I actually have read a bunch of science fiction books about it and how kind of like the, 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 you know, again, because the culture and everything changes over time. Maybe the, 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 the 10th generation doesn't want to go to Alpha Centauri. Oh, you know what true. I mean? Like, Tur they get there, the 10th generation is like, turn around. That's, that's what this book's about, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> funny. So basically they get there and actually it's a hostile and friendly environment <laughs> and then they have to turn around. Go back to Earth. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, like, how, how much of a bummer is that? It's well, like, they have oh, the freedom to choose. That's right. right? It's yeah. like National Lampoon's when they get to kind of Wally World, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. and then it's closed, you know, right, and so right. now you got to go home.